one of the things that I found when um, I was eating a lot of bread and pasta is that I would have a good meal. Like say I would have like chicken with maybe um, some vegetables or something like that, a nice big That's healthy good. meal, and I would still be hungry afterwards for sugar. I would like my body, I was stuffed. Like I ate like a half a chicken. I'll eat a half a chicken. And my body was like, we need a cookie. I need a cookie. Come on, man, give me a cookie. Like I need some ice cream. There was there was there was some gut bacteria craving, and that's it's what it seemed like. It seemed like some bizarre craving. It wasn't a craving like I needed more calories. Wait, were you eating these at this? Like, was this? Would you typically eat something yes. with refined sugar? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Well, something. This is an interesting effect, and sorry if I cut you off, but that's okay. something that does happen when you eat refined sugars like something not a piece of fruit which has the the fiber matrix and all Mm -hmm. these polyphenols by the way polyphenols are plant insecticides it's all we were talking about it's all this other good stuff when you take the refined sugar away from that um what happens is when your your gut so your gut digests it um and it refined sugar usually is like a glucose small it's a it's 50 percent glucose and 50 percent fructose and that's sucrose and that's what's in table sugar it's what's in a lot of refined sugars um what happens is that when you cleave the sucrose and the, and uh, you cleave the sucrose to this glucose and the fructose the fructose itself doesn't get absorbed by all the cells it only gets metabolized in the liver and it does something it's that's called atp trapping so what it does is it it traps ATP, which is the source of energy, and it does this because it's trying to like do this whole other complicated enzymatic reaction, blah, 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 right? But what it does is trap the ATP, and this sends a signal through the vagal nerve to your brain, I don't have energy, and so you don't get satiated. And so you, when you eat refined sugars, and now this is independent from the gut bacteria craving stuff you're talking about. I'm not exactly sure how all that works, but what I'm talking about is real. It's ATP trapping and it's 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 something that uh, is known to be a cause of why you can eat a bunch of fructose and refined sugar uh, and not be satiated and so you have to eat more because your body your brain thinks you haven't been fed because the atp has been trapped it's called atp trapping wow that's one possibility that could be could have been happening it's really it's also why a lot of people that eat a lot of refined sugars with sucrose or high fructose corn syrup is the worst when they eat that why is high fructose corn syrup the worst? Because then, so when your gut, so the way your gut, okay, let's just, let's compare table sugar, sucrose mm-hmm. to high fructose corn syrup. Both are bad. But when you compare the two, um, because sucrose is got, it's got glucose, I mean, it's got glucose and fructose. High fructose corn syrup does too. It has more fructose. But the thing is, is that um, when it, when the sucrose sees your gut, your gut has something in it called sucrases. Which cleave, which it takes basically, it's it's slower to cleave and digest the the sugar, so it's not like a big bolus that your gut sees. So it's not as irritating on the gut because it has to first the sucrases have to cleave the sucrose, and so like all this stuff is happening. Whereas when you get the high fructose corn syrup, that doesn't happen. It's a big bolus, and it's like it it literally like causes a a breakdown in your gut barrier. It's like irritant. It's an irritant. The same thing can happen if you take like too much of um, I mean, there's lots of other things that happen, but if you take too much like magnesium or something, people can get gut irritation. It's a big bolus on the gut and it's irritant. And that's what high fructose corn syrup does. And there's also then the whole a- ATP trapping thing is like exponential with high fructose corn syrup. So there's all, more fructose. It's compounded. There's a bunch of different factors. Yeah, there's a bunch of different factors. Of course, the fructose is very different in fruit because of the matrix, the fiber, it's digested differently. It's It's completely different than taking table sugar or high fructose corn syrup who is the monster that extracted that stuff i mean it's so bad how when was that done when did they figure out how to do that i mean they used to do cane sugar right was it Where world they war ii i don't know it, i don't know i know there's people that are super into to all that stuff but yeah it's cheaper that's why it's cheaper and it's hidden it's in everything I mean, if you go out and go to a Chili's and think you're going to eat healthy, you order a salad and there's like 60 grams of sugar in their Waldorf salad because it's all in the dressing, high fructose corn syrup. That is insane. Okay, here it is. The 1970 was first introduced to food and beverage industry, high fructose corn syrup was first introduced to the food and beverage industry in the 1970s. 
That's amazing that that stuff from 1970 until today, so in the, in the last 40 plus years, has become a massive part of our diets. The average, this was published in, it was like the health organization in somewhere in the UK, and whatever they call that. There was some health organization in UK that, that get, did a press release and said that the average five-year-old consumes 50 grams of sugar a day. Oh my God. Sorry. Yeah. 50 grams. Is it 50 grams a day or is it 50 grams a year? Yeah, no, no 50 grams a day. It's 50 grams a day, which was their weight. It was, okay, awesome. now I'm remembering. It was, yeah, it would be awesome. It was 50 grams a day, which was the average of body, their entire body weight of a five year old. A year. A year. So if you have a bag of sugar the size of a five year old, that five year old will eat that in a year. Exactly. Jesus. And I did Christ. some calculations. It comes out to like a pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks, which has like sixty four oh. grams of sugar. Oh my God. It's it's crazy. Oh and the- God, everything. Oh. There's a particular type of uh, gut bacteria that craves sugar and that thrives on sugar though, isn't there? Um you know, yeast are, are thriving on sugar, but they're not gut bacteria. Your there, gut- was a, there was like a uh, documentary, an online mm-hmm. thing that I watched on the various documentary on different gut bacteria that are attracted to. So I don't, maybe this is, I, I know that, so that your gut bacteria, what, what they eat is fiber. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're mostly in your colon. And so when you're, when you eat a fiber deficient diet, um, proteins, lipids, you know, sugars are all absorbed in the upper intestine, but your your bacteria in your gut starve. And in order to stop themselves from starving, they actually start to cannibalize the gut barrier that they live on because it's, oh. it's got carbohydrates. And so a low fiber diet can cause massive gut, you know, barrier breakdown. It's actually the most, in terms of magnitude, the most potent thing that regulates gut health is wow. fiber. So is that like irritable bowel syndrome, things along those lines? Well, that well that can that can happen, but you don't have to have irritable bowel syndrome to have your gut barrier breaking down. You know, you can have a low level of inflammation, not know it. Mm. Um, but there are certain <clears throat> types of bacteria that can thrive in the condition. Now, maybe that maybe let's say you have a low fiber diet, meaning you're eating a lot of refined sugar. So it's kind of like the same, right? You're eating a bunch of refined sugar and in place of plants and fiber rich foods. There's a certain type of bacteria that can thrive on low fiber. And it's a type of bacteria that I don't know the name of, but they have little flagella, things that like move, you know, little spermazole. Little sperm, yeah, exactly like that. And so they'll like swim up. So your bacteria are supposed to be in the colon, the very, very end of your intestines, right? They're not supposed to be, you're not supposed to have a bunch of bacteria in your small intestine. Well, they'll swim up to the small intestine because that's where the food, that's where the proteins and the sugars and the lipids are all getting absorbed. They'll swim up there. And this is often referred to as um, bacterial overgrowth. So small intestine bacterial overgrowth is what the technical term is. Bacterial overgrowth is actually when your bacteria are starting to grow in your small intestine. And what happens is... When you have bacteria in your small intestine, it releases something called zonulin. Um, and this work has all been done by Alessio Fasano. And he's, I think he's at like Massachusetts Children's Hospital. Anyway, he discovered this. So, you know, he's a rock star for figuring this stuff out. But so when you have this, this intestinal over- overgrowth, you release something called zonulin. Zonulin is also what's released when gluten, when your body sees gluten. Zonulin... Um, it literally like you have the gut barrier and there's like these junctions with the barrier. It opens up the junctions, the tight junctions. Um, and in people that don't have like celiac or they don't have a really, really poor gut health, they close. So it's like a transient. It's like open, close, open, close. And so what, when they open, your inflammatory cells can see the bacteria that's there. Usually the barrier separates them because what do, what do immune cells do when they see bacteria? Fire away, war. So the small intestinal um, bacterial overgrowth does that, and so does so gluten. Gluten also causes zonulin to be released, but um, so that would cause like bloating and inflammation, you know, things like that. Wow, God, it's just so it, it, it's so crazy how much your diet actually affects your overall health, and how few people really consider it when they're thinking about what they're eating and the consequences of what they're eating. And they your just brain, eat what tastes good. And your brain, your brain yeah. health. It, it's <clears throat> you know having low inflammation is key for your brain. All these different factors that are playing on inside your body, like all this stuff. I know. Yeah. No. I'm. 
eating a, a, di- a diet that's high in fiber, that's one of the reasons why I actually I eat a lot of wide vi- diversity because there's lots of different types of fiber. There's, you know, fiber is not just like one nutrient. You know, people always tweet at me, oh, can I take pectin? Can I can I take inulin? And, you know, which yeah. is a type of fiber. And it's like, well, yeah, you can. But, you know, these different types of bacteria, there's so many different types of bacteria and they are, they're eating different types of fiber. And we don't even know all what each of them are eating. We just, we know the best thing we can do right now is to get a broad spectrum. You know, so there's fiber in the, in plants, there's fiber that are called uh, ligands and cellulose. Um, in fruits, there's pectins like apple, uh, citrus uh, peel have pectins. Beta-glucans are in mushrooms, they're in oats. Um, resistant starches in legumes, beans. There's inulin, which is in plants and also like onions, artichokes, garlic. And all these different types of fiber are feeding different types of bacteria. And the best thing you want is like a diverse bacterial set. So feeding them all different types of fiber is good. Plus you're getting all the plant hormetic compounds and then you're getting all the micronutrients, you know, magnesium.